Hey everyone, this is Mrs. Moriarty and I'm here to discuss with us uh, our lecture topic on 1.2, which is all about terrestrial biomes. So what do we need to know about terrestrial biomes? Well, these are going to be collections of ecosystems that are often categorized by where they may fall on Earth. And where they fall on Earth tells us there's going to be a particular combination of annual precipitation as well as temperature. These two abiotic factors then can help us determine what kind of plant growth may be there, as well as what types of then animals will also be within that biome. Now there are a couple biomes that you need to know for our AP exam and they are listed here and I'm going to go through each of those uh, within this slideshow here. So that would be a taiga or boreal forest, uh, temperate rainforest or temperate seasonal forest can also be called the temperate deciduous, tropical rainforest, shrublands, temperate grasslands, savanna, desert, and tundra are all ones that you need to know as well as characteristics of each. Now I said before, uh, terrestrial biomes are characterized by where they may fall on Earth, especially in with whatever latitude they may fall on Earth. Um, and when we get to Unit 4, we'll talk a little bit more about this, but because of where they fall in terms of latitude can determine how much sunlight there will be, which then plays a role in temperature, which also plays a role in um, humidity right, or precipitation. So taking a look at the first one here, this would be the characteristics that can define what's known as the tundra. So this is a very cold and treeless biome, and it is often treeless because there's very low growing vegetation, very little precipitation throughout the year, and you can see that on what's known as a climatogram or climatograph. So that's what's um, here, that would be your annual precipitation, while the line here, that would be your then temperature. Uh, now, in the tundra, they actually have an underlying subsoil known as the permafrost. So this is permanently a uh, frozen layer of soil that in more warmer months um, can um, melt a little bit, water can drain, um, and that's how some of that vegetation winds up getting some water. But for the most part, that's going to stay permanently frozen. Um, you can find some maybe like woody shrubs, mosses and lichens, right? Very simple kind of vegetation because remember, right? Not as much precipitation available to them throughout uh, the year. Uh, now, because temperatures are so cold, precipitation is so lacking, chemical reactions that take place in this biome are very, very slow. So this can lead to also slow decomposition too. So whenever that vegetation happens to die, right, it takes a very long time to break down and return back to the soil. So then we see also low levels of soil nutrients in this biome too. Then that brings me to the taiga, or known as the boreal forest. You can kind of see it is still a bit chilly. Uh, it's still a bit cold of a biome, right? It's not really up in our polar regions like the tundra. Um, it's really a bit closer to more of the between 60 and 90 degrees in terms of latitude. Here's where forests kind of make up uh, the primary part of this biome, and that would specifically be coniferous types of trees or cone-bearing trees, evergreen trees. Right? These trees are adapted for those very cold winters and very short growing seasons. We can see, though, that there is more precipitation here, which does allow for more complex vegetation and life. Um, this subarctic biome can have a very cold climate and plant growth can be, once again, constrained by its temperature and precipitation. Soil is usually nutrient poor because, once again, decomp is also slow. You also have to think back to the adaptation of your coniferous trees or cone-bearing trees, evergreen trees, right? Their types of leaves are in the form of a needle, um, and that's to help prevent any evaporation. When those needles fall on the forest floor, they have a very waxy coating on them, and it's very difficult for them to break down. So once again, the taiga doesn't really have um, as many soil nutrients, too. Now, in looking at our human impact on the boreal forest or taiga, we tend to use this biome for a lot of our logging uh, lumber. We get a lot of our paper products uh, from this type of biome. Moving on to then the temperate rainforest. Now you can see this uh, climatograph very different from the previous two. 
far greater amounts um, of precipitation, a little bit more consistent temperatures. Uh, this type of biome is usually located uh, near coastal areas, right, because we can see in the first bullet point, ocean currents tend to help kind of moderate any temperature fluctuation we might see, and it also provides a bit more water vapor or humidity to this biome. So they get mild temperatures, lots of precipitation, we can see really, really large trees here. Um, so that's why, right, in California, right, we have lots of temperate rainforests, um, as well as Alaska, southern Chile, uh, as where you're going to find majority of these biomes. And just kind of like our taiga arboreal forests, we can see logging occurs here too. Moving on to the temperate seasonal forest. This is the type of biome that we reside in. Um, in the northeast here. We can see we have a pretty consistent uh, amount of precipitation throughout the year, and we can also see our temperature kind of fluctuates. Um, our biome tends to be dominated by broadleaf deciduous trees, so these are going to be trees that tend to lose their leaves in the fall. We get warmer uh, summer temperatures, and this can help to actually favor decomposition, right? The warmer it is, the faster that breaking down of materials can become, which means soils tend to have some pretty decent nutrients here um, in the temperate seasonal forest. So soils are very productive, and it can be converted for agricultural purposes. Moving on to now the tropical rainforest, right here looking at the uh, climatograph, temperatures really don't fluctuate here. They stay right very high pretty consistently and lots and lots of rainfall. Now, the reason why we see this is because this biome is pretty much located approximately 20 degrees north or south uh, of the equator, so it's kind of in that middle part of our Earth, so it's getting lots and lots of sunlight, which means high temperatures, lots of precipitation. Um, so here, all that precipitation, high temperatures, allows for lots of biodiversity, lots of vegetation. So the tropical rainforest is really the most biodiverse terrestrial biome that we have on Earth. Its productivity is credibly high, decomposition is very rapid due to those high, high temperatures. But because decomp is rapid and there's just so much vegetation that the vegetation can actually take up the nutrients very, very quickly. So it's interesting that the tropical rainforest, although right, allows for all this productivity, soil nutrients can be low, but that's just because they're taken up so quickly. Moving on to the temperate grassland. Here you can see a little more variation amongst the precipitation as well as a pretty large uh, variation amongst the temperature. So here the temperate grassland, they can experience very cold, harsh winters and hot, dry summers. Here's where right, we would find like the Great Plains of North America would be considered temperate grasslands. Um, so here, due to those uh, abiotic factors, our plant growth is going to be constrained by insufficient precipitation in certain seasons, as well as the fluctuation in temperatures. Here is where we can see lots of grazing type animals due to the types of grasses and kind of woody flowering plants that grow here. Um, and because of that kind of infrequent precipitation, grazing, and all that kind of stuff, fires tend to be quite frequent here. Um, and a lot of the grasses uh, are adapted for those types of fires. Um, and it's actually that fire that can kind of like help recycle nutrients. So fires here is something that's common and something that is natural tends to have a relatively long growing season, rapid decomp, can add to lots of nutrients found in the soil here, and that's a part of the reason why, in the United States at least, um, lots of this type of land has been converted for agricultural use. Looking at a shrubland or woodland, um, here looking at the climatograph, we can see right very little precipitation during some months, a little bit more during others, with little temperature variation. So here's there's a 12 month growing season, but our plant growth will be constrained by the low precipitation. This is usually found on like that southern coast of California or Australia. And once again, wildfires are very common here too, as those plants can also be adapted uh, to that factor as well.
Due to uh, that kind of low precipitation, soil nutrients can be low, um, and agricultural use for grazing animals and drought tolerant crops, such as grapes, tend to be used in this biome. How about the then savanna or tropical seasonal forest is what it can also be called. Um, here we see very warm temperatures and very distinct wet and dry seasons amongst its annual precipitation. So the soil in this biome tends to be fairly fertile because of those high temperatures. There are still high decomp rates, but that low precipitation can constrain some of the plants during some seasons. Um, here they tend to have the longest dry seasons uh, amongst any of the tropical climates. Um, and here we can see types of vegetation would be things like grasses and maybe some scattered deciduous trees. Next would be our desert, right? Very, very little precipitation throughout the entirety of the year. Um, this biome is typically found between uh, 30 degrees north or south latitude on Earth. We've got very hot temperatures, extremely dry conditions, so any type of life that is found here is very well adapted to those conditions, right? So things like cacti, succulents, um, we tend to see very slow growth amongst the plants that are there, uh, and so the deserts can be very vulnerable to any type of disturbance. So going based off of that, kind of like the last piece uh, with our biomes, right? Depending upon what type of source comes from that biome, like for example, a lot of our forest type biomes, we get a lot of our paper products, uh, lumber, timber, and so on, um, as well as some of the other biomes that we might use for agricultural purposes. Um, we can start to kind of see almost a shift amongst those biomes, and we see this shift as a result of uh, climate change. And so warming climates will actually shift uh, our taiga or boreal forest probably further north. Our tundra, right where we find that permafrost, that, that permanently frozen soil, is going to probably continue to melt over time and the lower latitudes will become too warm right for any of those types of trees. So we're going to most likely see a lot of our, our forest ecosystems being incredibly impacted by climate change and really the taiga and tundra are going to be impacted at a much greater rate than really any other biome on earth. Alrighty folks, here comes our practice FRQ on 1.2. So using this graph here to the left, you want to answer these two questions on your FRQ journal and in the Ed Puzzle. So here I identified two biomes with the most rainfall per year. I identified two biomes where the hydrologic or water cycle moves the slowest due to low evaporation. Okay, at this point you should have answered your FRQ. Uh, so here would be your accepted answers. Uh, the tropical and temperate rainforest on this graph have the most rainfall, followed by the answers of the subtropical desert, you could have said temperate grasslands or tundra all have the lowest annual precipitation on our graph, which means they're going to have the slowest moving hydrologic cycle. All right, everyone, that's it uh, for our video on 1.2. If you have any questions, please leave that at the end of the video.